Welcome, everybody. We are reconvening uh, the ISFMP Policy Board. Uh, we, st we started these conversations on Monday. Uh, as a reminder, we did approve the agenda, but before we get started, I do want to ask if anybody has anything additional at this point in time that they might want to add at the end. Not seeing any hands. Great. Mr. And Chairman. As a note, we do have letters, additional letters from two boards, the um, the Lobster Board and the Shad and River Herring Board. Great. I've got those, Tony. Yep, I've got those in my notes. Thank you. And Sheree uh, has her hand up. And I do have a hand up. Uh, Sheree. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to, under other business, bring up a question and a recommendation in regards to including TC or PRT's recommendations when we um, do our canned motions. Thanks. Great. I will call on you uh, under other business. Thanks, Sheree. Um, anybody else not seeing any other hands? Um, great. Um, as is customary when we start any of our meetings, uh, even though this is kind of round two for the policy board, I would like to ask if there's any member of the public that has anything that they'd like to bring to the policy board that is not on the agenda. Desmond Kane. Chairman, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Desmond. Great, thank you. Um, Actually, my name is pronounced Khan, but I know you couldn't tell that. In any case, I would like to speak for a minute about the MRIP program. I understand that some members of the policy board and other people are have been expressing unease with some of the MRIP results. And uh, I, myself, and other colleagues share that concern. Before the new version of MRIP, which greatly increased the estimates of uh, effort and catch, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Victor Creco from the Connecticut Bureau of Marine Fisheries, he's now retired, started studying MRIP and he, he found that it was very difficult to ground truth the estimates from MRIP. However, there was one, one of their uh, products that could be compared with other sources, and that was their estimate of the number of participants in fisheries. And uh, on their query, you know, query form, you can request that information. And prior, you know, this was back at like, say around 2010 or a little before, when they we produced their estimates of the participants in the fisheries, they were extremely high, they were inflated, they were usually between three and four times the number of marine licenses sold in a state. For example, I, I'm from Delaware. I was working for Delaware at the time. We were selling 100, about 110, something like 110,000 licenses. According to MRIP, there were over 300,000 participants in our fishery most years. So one thing that implies is that the majority of people in our fishery, and this is also true for Connecticut, uh, did not have licenses because they couldn't. And so uh, both uh, Dr. Krekel and myself checked with our respected enforcement agencies to find out, you know, what percentage of people that they check are on license. In both cases, it was about 15 to 20 percent. So that evidence seemed to falsify the MRIP estimates. Now, we were, since they were very greatly overestimating the number of participants, we thought that could indicate they were overestimating the number of fishing trips and consequently the catch. And we 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 talked to them about this, but they they said that well, you know that that estimate of participants is not really the same thing as what we use to estimate trips and effort and so forth. So uh, we 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 were kind of. Um, Stonewall for a minute there, but um, then they did this upgrade. They they were telling Dr. Krakow on, you know, some of the ASMFC boards, they're trying to fix this, Vic, and they're, they did a big effort, as you know, and they came up with all of a sudden now they've got far more trips. 
So I recently went back and uh, queried them for the number of participants in the fishery just to see if that had changed. Well, turns out they they output the number of participants up to, I think it's 2016, and after that, they do not provide any more estimates. Now, that is since they've changed their, you know, increased the, the estimates of trips. I don't know why they stopped producing these estimates, but I would like to suggest that the commission consider investigating this and find out how they calculate these estimates of participants, why they're not producing them currently, at least the last time I checked last year, and, um, and, and see if that gives some kind of clues as to what has been going on with the MRIP estimates. And I can provide the board with uh, reports, a report that Dr. Kreko wrote, and also some data I collected. Uh, I made a presentation to the striped bass uh, board hey, at the Jeff, when I was Jasmine, I, Jasmine, I do have to cut you short. You're, you're over three minutes into this. I appreciate you bringing that forward. Um, if you do want to supply anything to the commission, I would ask you to do so. I think you, you brought up issues that I know have been talked about amongst managers in the past. So uh, I do appreciate you raising that again. Um, and again, please feel free to share anything that you, you might like to. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. And sorry about uh, uh, That's okay. I mispronouncing was... your name. I, 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 know, I knew how to do it. It was just uh, it caught me by surprise. So anyway, any, okay. any other members of the public? Not seeing any other hands go up. Um, I'm going to move right into the executive committee report, and um, I'll ask um, uh, Director Beal to jump in and back me up on a, on a couple of these issues. Um, as you all know, the executive committee has been meeting also um, by phone in between uh, in between the regular meeting schedules to address issues, in particular uh, the CARES Act. I think we've had probably four or five, maybe even six uh, calls between uh, between the October meeting and now. Uh, the February 3rd Executive Committee, um, as part of this meet winter meeting, um, was fairly extensive. We discussed a few um, bigger topics. Uh, we discussed several times in particular, um, uh, we've had as many calls, excuse me, in particular around the CARES Act, and, and uh, the third was no exception. Uh, we, we had a presentation by Kelly Dennett uh, on the CARES Act. She did explain to us that round two was approved by Congress. There will be an additional $255 million that will go out to the states and territories and another $30 million for federally recognized tribes uh, and $15 million for the Great Lakes region. Uh, NOAA is currently working with the new administration on the timing regarding the release of the funds uh, and they currently don't have an estimate of when that might happen. They have uh, did tell the executive committee that uh, they do have a, a date of September 2021 that they need to have the money out the door by, but um, as was the case last time, the states will have more flexibility on that as long as their spend plans have been finalized. Uh, there'll be some additional information coming regarding the remaining funds from round one as well. And, and the fact that they're not going to be able to be commingled with round funds for, that will be available in round two. Uh, more details, as I say, will be coming on that. Um, and I know Laura Leach will be uh, engaged in those conversations uh, around that uh, financial management of the funds. The executive committee did have many questions for Kelly. I'm not going to go through them all here today. Um, uh, she's tried to work uh, with us on a lot of these questions and answers all the time, and I've been very appreciative of the support that she's given to all of the states. Uh, there was one question in particular that was asked, I think that will be um, interesting for folks to find out, um, and hopefully we'll, we'll receive positive information, but it was in regards to the made more than whole um, uh, Bill Anderson asked the question around whether they could put a floor on that because it's not part of the act. It's actually a policy so that NOAA has put forward associated with the spend plans. And if their floor could be put in place and we wouldn't have quite so much oversight on uh, on the made more than whole. So we are looking forward to getting a, an answer back on particular on that topic as well. 
Um, she did promise that she'll follow up with us uh, on that and, and many other questions, and I'm sure we'll have her back to the executive committee for any additional uh, um, questions that might come up. And as uh, as she gets that information um, regarding the new the new round two, I know she'll be reaching out. So with that, um, I'm going to just pause for a second to see if there are any questions that pertain to the CARES Act. Not seeing any hands, I'm going to keep going. Uh, um, the, Bob Eel did give us uh, an over, overview of some legislative and appropriations issues. He updated the executive committee. Um, uh, Bob presented that he and Deke will continue to monitor all congressional activities as is always the case. At this time, there seems to be no focus on anything pertaining to the Atlantic Coast Act, so that is good news. Um, as you're sure, I'm, all, I'm sure you're all aware, the Secretary of Commerce appointment has been made. Um, that is Governor Romano from Rhode Island, and I believe her uh, confirmation hearing was today, uh, and likely the vote will be today. Um, several leadership positions within NOAA, uh, including the Chief of Staff, have been named. The Assistant Administrator position is yet to be filled, uh, but Paul Doremus, who, who we all know, has been named the Acting Administrator, uh, Assistant Administrator. Uh, Bob also reported out that the Hill um, Hill committees and the membership on those committees are continuing to be worked out, especially on the Senate side, um, with a split in um, a 50-50 split uh, in makeup. They're trying to figure out who's going to be leading uh, what committee. So I'm sure it's going to be a little bit before we hear anything more uh, final on that. Uh, the executive committee also has uh, approved a letter. Um, that was advanced by the legislative committee. This letter has been drafted and reviewed by the executive committee to be sent to the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, it spells out the priorities of the commission. This particular letter did draw some conversation at the executive committee uh, around the Chesapeake Bay and uh, needed, um, uh, needed money for doing some assessments within the bay pertaining to Menhaden. Uh, the executive committee did support including a line uh, around that need uh, for additional dollar works and uh, for additional dollars uh, and that uh, change the letter will be made and shared with the executive committee before it is sent out. Um, if you did see my chair's memo in regards to uh, the committee makeups uh, and appointments, one of the committees that we did leave um, unnamed at this time was the legislative committee. The legislative committee was renewed with new focus and energy last year, and it has been very active uh, looking at issues that are important to the commission. The reason I left it blank this year was to review its progress, not only review its progress, but determine whether we needed to strengthen the membership with people with stronger Hill experience. I do want to make clear that with that statement, I'm not um, I'm, I'm not disparaging the people that are on it by any stretch of the imagination, but um, the conversations that Bob and I have had uh, around Hill work pertaining to a new administration coming in, um, raise the issue of do we need people, more people on that committee with stronger Hill experience. So uh, there was not a lot of input from uh, the executive committee on that topic other than uh, it seeming some head nods, seeming you're on the right track. So we will be looking at the membership and we'll finalize the makeup of the legislative committee um, uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, any questions about legislative issues or budgets for Bob or I? Not seeing any hands. I will continue on. Uh, switching gears, Laura Leach did update us on the 2021 annual meeting. Obviously, we're hoping by October travel restrictions for all states will be lifted and uh, we'll be seeing some positive changes dealing with the pandemic. Um, this we, we're going to hold hold true to the plan from last year. So uh, Joe Semino and the New Jersey delegation will be hosting us in 2021. Uh, under new business, the executive committee did have a conversation around black sea bass allocation and the decision that happened on Monday. Uh, Jim Gilmore from New York raised the issue not to rehash the vote, but just to discuss how we as a body are going to deal directly with the allocations issue. Uh, in the face of climate change. Uh, John Hare did uh, chime in on this topic uh, and reminded us that the uh, Science Center, along with the Commission and the Nature Conservancy, are pulling together a contract that would allow us to do some scenario planning uh, on that topic. 
So there will be more information coming on that, but uh, it, uh, after the meeting, we did talk about the need for having a presentation of the policy board on scenario planning, and Dr. Hare did um, promise uh, to uh, make staff available to, to uh, do that presentation. There will be a lot more conversations around this uh, going forward. Um, uh, there was recommendation that a working group consist, consisting of members of the policy board get together to start working on this. Bob and I will be discussing that more, uh, and the executive committee will uh, will hash that out and we'll bring something back to the policy board for consideration, uh, likely at the spring meeting. So that concludes my report of the executive committee. Does anybody have any additional questions before we move on with the agenda? Seeing no hands. Um, We'll move right on to agenda item number eight then, which is progress update on the risk and uncertainty policy. And that's uh, Jason McNamee. Jason, are you out there somewhere in the virtual world? Okay. Go ahead, Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Thanks everybody. Uh, we wanted to give you an update. There's been uh, some work done on the risk and uncertainty uh, policy and we've got a presentation that I'll jump through here. Uh, so I think that's Maya out there. So Maya, next slide please. So just a reminder, the goal of the policy is to provide a consistent yet flexible mechanism to account for risk and uncertainty in the decision-making that we do as a commission. And, and the reason for this is to protect all of the commission-managed stocks from the risk of overfishing as one example, and to also minimize adverse social, economic, or ecosystem effects, or at least take account of them within our um, risk management and, and when we're making these decisions. Next slide. So the tool consists of a series of questions. The questions, not shockingly, are related to risk and uncertainty. Um, and these responses are weighted based on uh, their relative importance within the overall um, decision tree. And so these weighted responses are combined and what they uh, spit out at the end is a recommended probability of achieving whatever management objective uh, it was that we were trying to achieve. And so as an example, the, it could be the probability that we want um, F to be less than that F threshold. And that's just a graphical representation where you can see the weightings go along with the responses to each of the questions, they kind of make their way through the decision, true, decision tool and then uh, provide a recommended probability. Next slide. So the tool questions are split basically into four components. The first is stock status. So that's one uh, we talk about routinely. The second category is additional uncertainty. So that's uh, model uncertainty, management uncertainty, uh, environmental uncertainty. The third category is sort of an additional risk category. And um, one of the things that we've been thinking about for that category right now is ecosystem importance. So, um, you know, the importance of whatever species uh, it is that we're talking about uh, within the ecosystem. And then there's a fourth category uh, where we will consider socio and economic um, issues. And so the way the tool works is the first three components, they add to the probability, meaning they make it more conservative depending on how much you, um, you add in or where you are with regard to stock status and things like that. But, and this is the unique part for the tool that we're trying to to develop, the socioeconomic component can add or subtract from that probability. So if you are going to, for instance, impact dramatically a highly dependent fishing community, that would actually pull that buffer back, um, you know, to make it 
less conservative to consider those, um, those types of factors. Next slide. So talking a little bit uh, more in detail about the criteria, the risk and uncertainty working group was tasked with refining the criteria for the, uh, the decision tool inputs, basically the responses um, that would go uh, into the tool. And a group of risk and uncertainty working group members and assessment and science committee members provided input on the those basically those first three categories, the model management um, and environmental uncertainty, I'm sorry, the third category, which was the um, model management and environmental uncertainty, and not the third category, but the second category, sorry. Uh, and so from that group, we got a recommendation, uh, and that was for the criteria for those components for them to be broad. And, and the reason for that, that would allow the technical committees to adapt their scoring to factors that are most relevant for their species. So it, it's basically to allow customization for the species being um, analyzed. Um, and so the individual technical committees may develop specific scoring rubrics uh, for their species. So it'll be spelled out specifically um, for that species, but everything will be working basically under the same framework. So there's consistency there, but allowing for some uh, customization because each of the species that we manage have their uh, own foibles and they are unique. Next slide. So um, the, refi the refined criteria, they uh, include a list of factors that the technical community may consider when scoring each decision tool question. Um, and again, which factors uh, are important for each individual species is up to the, the technical committee. They're gonna provide that, um, that guidance. And so, um, this is just a subsample of the different types of things that could fit under these different categories, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about here. Um, and there's a little bit more uh, in the meeting materials, um, a little more detail that you can look at. But this gives you, you know, a sense of what we're talking about here. So model uncertainty would be things like retrospective patterns, sensitivity runs, and the uncertainty associated with those, um, the model fits. Management uncertainty would be the performance of uh, management that we've implemented in the past. Initiation of relevant uh, management actions, like how long does it take us to um, get those going? And then things like um, illegal or uh, underreported uh, fishing activities. Next slide. Um, and then under the categories of environmental uncertainty, we could be talking about uh, environmental drivers of recruitment, climate vulnerability, um, natural mortality or uh, uncertainty in the natural mortality for that species. And then the ecosystem and trophic importance that could be, um, you know, does the species provide um, some specific ecosystem services? What is the importance of that species to other key species in the ecosystem? Uh, and so that gives you a sense of the types of things that the technical committee could consider and what they would build into their species specific rubric for the decision tool. Next slide. Now getting into some of the socioeconomic criteria, um, the committee for economic and social science, they developed specific criteria for um, for scoring these socioeconomic components. And it's you know, pretty formulaic. You've got short-term and long-term um, effects of proposed management. And then those are subdivided into commercial and recreational. So you end up with roughly four questions each um, for each sector, commercial or recreational, you have a short-term and a long-term effect. Next slide. So this is just a, a graphical representation um, of what I just talked about on the 
Last slide, so for the commercial fishery importance, you have the economic value of the fishery, uh, the fishery dependence for the communities that exist in the fishery, then you've got your short-term management effects, your long-term management effects, and then you get your score from those. Same thing on the recreational side. You have your fishery desirability, like how popular, how many people participate in that fishery. And again, uh, dependent communities on that, that fishery and then short-term and long-term effects. Now, these all pivot off of the proposed management action or actions um, that are being considered um, by the board. And I'll talk a little bit more about you know, the early stuff that I've been talking about and then these uh, socioeconomic criteria and how those work in the process uh, in a moment. Next slide. So uh, the following indicators, uh, they would be used for scoring that socioeconomic criteria. So you've got commercial economic value, things like total special value along the coast. Then you've got your commercial community dependence. Um, and so that could be defined as X vessel value as a percent of the X vessel value for all species for the top 10 um, communities. Um, and I won't read through you know, the entire slide, you, you can read it, but the idea here is you um, look at a three-year average for, for each of these, and then this is how, this is the data you would put together to create your uh, socioeconomic score. Next slide. Uh, a little bit about the weightings. So I mentioned that early on. Uh, and what the weightings are, they are multipliers that impact how much each decision to a question impacts that final outcome. And so if you change the weightings, what that can do is it can actually change the size of the buffer that you're adding. So whether the overfish status adds 2% or 5% or 10%, um, you know, onto your buffer, but it also defines the relative importance of that component within the overall tool. And so, um, you know, the example here is, is stock status on equal footing with the other components in the tool, or is it two times as important, 10 times as important, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you can get a sense of the importance uh, of these weightings. And this is where, this is the really important policy aspect of the overall tool. Um, and so how do we get at these weightings? One of the ways we could do that is we could develop a survey and we can use that survey to determine the board's preferences. And there's an example survey within uh, the meeting materials. I think it's uh, page 58 of the, the PDF um, under the first link for, for the policy board um, meeting materials. So you can take a peek at that. And that is one mechanism we could use to get at get at these weightings in kind of an, an objective and comprehensive way um, with the boards. Next slide. Okay, so a little bit about the process. So uh, some adjustments were made uh, to what we've talked about previously with the risk and uncertainty process. And we did this to avoid um, bottlenecks in the management um, process, kind of keeps, uh, you know, the creation and updating of the, the decision tool from the actual, you know, when you're in the throes of a management action, you want to have that tool developed um, already to some extent ahead of time. But it also allows the socioeconomic component um, to then assess the effect of the specified proposed management action. And this would be separated out. So you'd separate out the socioeconomic component because that would be kind of more of the immediate um, reaction to a proposed management action. And this is where the board can really, you know, dig into this tool and, and um, have their influence. And the nice thing about that, and what we've talked about all along is having these things kind of explicitly spelled out 
provides a lot of transparency in our process. So we're, we're you know, out there telling um, the public why we're you know, downweighting the short-term effect or upweighting the short-term effect relative to the long-term effect and, and things of that nature. Next slide. Um, so developing uh, the decision tool, this tool is developed separately from the management action. Generally, the board uh, provides input on the weightings and then the technical committee and the committee for economic and social science, they provide the responses to the decision tool questions, but then the board can make adjustments to those inputs if appropriate. And so when developing the decision tool, all of the components of the decision tool will be completed, except the management effect portion of the socioeconomic component. And those will be scored when a specific management action is being developed and considered. And then this can be iterative. So the board can provide feedback on those weightings in the decision tool answers, and that will kind of feed back in uh, to the tool so it can evolve over time. You're not locked into some static decision, but you'll have to do those types of changes explicitly and really define why you wanna make, um, make those changes. Next slide. Almost to the end here, Mr. Chair. Uh, so let's say we had an anticipated management action for a species. So we have, we've had a stock assessment, um, and there's a need for action. So that will trigger a review and possible update of the decision tool. Um, then the technical committee, they're gonna take a look at that. They may leave it, everything might still be relevant. So they might not have much work to do at all, um, or they'll make any necessary updates that they need to make, um, you know, based on stock assessment outputs or whatever. And then uh, they'll produce the preliminary probability and harvest level. This is without that socioeconomic component. And then that will be uh, developed into a, a report. That report, um, including the, that preliminary probability, will be forwarded to the CES. The CES then evaluates the management effect, portions of the socioeconomic component. Um, they'll base that on the preliminary harvest level and other relevant information provided by the technical committee. And they may also update the other socioeconomic scores as needed. And then the final socioeconomic scores are added to the decision tool and a final recommended probability is produced. The report is then made to the board. Uh, it will include all of those decision tool inputs, justifications, um, and that preliminary probability uh, and harvest level. And then the final recommend recommended uh, probability will be there for the board's consideration. And then the board can get involved. They can make any changes to, to the decision tool, to the decision tool. Uh, and we just need to justify those changes and add those to the reports. So now we've got a good document um, of our process. And then once that probability is improved, uh, approved, it will be used to develop those management options. Next slide. So here's a look um, at the striped bass example. Important note, this is just illustrative. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of things, we just made this up just to kind of show you what it would look like. So to orient you to the table, you can see here, um, you've got a column called weight. Those would be the weightings for each of those. And you can see in this case, the weightings are all equal. And then you can see the various scores associated with each of those line items in the decision tool, and then you get your outcome. In this um, mock example, this would have been a recommended probability of a 62% um, probability of whatever the management objective was supposed to be. Next slide. Okay, um, here's our proposed next step. So. We, you asked us previously to walk through that uh, striped bass example. We provided that a couple of times. I just did a quick um, run through. Well, what we'd like to do now is use the actual develop tool on the upcoming update assessment for Tata. Uh, and this will be a pilot case for the policy. Um, and so 
unlike the striped bass example, which was just kind of mocked up, this will be a, a real implementation of the process. But we're doing that prior to making this the official policy of the commission. And so, you know, if the outcome, we're going to provide you the outcome, you could consider it in your management um, action that you take at the end of the um, at the end of the TATOG uh, assessment process, but you won't be bound by it. You can kind of see how it goes, and then um, we can, you know, update the decision tool by running through this real-world example. And uh, next slide with that, Mr. Chair, I am happy to take any questions that anybody has. Grayson, great, Jason. I appreciate that. That was a great presentation. Um, there will be a test at the end of the meeting. Uh, any, anybody have any questions of Jason? Uh, Bill Hyatt. Yeah, Jay. Um, I have a question, and I've read through the materials, and but I I just can't grasp why socioeconomic uncertainty is combined with the biological stock assessment uncertainty I, into a single outcome number. It, it just sort of intuitively makes more sense to me that those would be presented as separate um, uncertainty levels. I, I guess I don't get the, um, I don't exactly how the justification for combining them, and I guess I don't understand why there's a benefit combining them as opposed to presenting them separately. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, I, I mean, I think that the short answer to your question is, you know, I I don't know how the board would manage within our existing process with two kind of competing separate um, probabilities, you know, um, of setting like a fishing mortality threshold tolerance or, or something to that effect. Now, if your concern is that you want to be able to kind of look at these things separately, you'll be able to do that in, in that you'll have all of the information separated out. Remember, in this latest process, we are actually doing the latter portion of the tool separately. That happens um, you know, once there's a management action proposed and, and on the table. Um, so you can kind of see it, like what it's doing within the overall probability that is produced. But in the end, what the technical committee needs is, or the stock assessment committee or whoever, what they need is a probability with which to then produce some options for the, the management board of, different, you know, potential management outcomes. What we tend to do now is, you know, we have this kind of multiplicative, okay, give us a, a 40, 50, 60% probability of these four possible management actions. And this cuts out that first layer of that and simplifies the process. Bill, did Thanks. that... Uh, answer all your questions well it, it certainly gave me more to think about so it's, i think it's going to take me a while i wrap my mind around this concept in total but thank you jay you're welcome great i have uh david borden john clark and then eric reed david uh, yeah thank you mr chairman jason fine job as always um with your tatag example since we have multiple stocks will the estimates be made will we have have uh, an estimate for each one of the stocks? Yeah, that's, uh, thank you for that, uh, David. And I said that, um, that same uh, thing to Sarah, uh, and Sarah's very funny response was, the good thing about using TOTOG is that, you know, we get to test it four times because there's four separate stocks. And the bad thing about doing the TOTOG example is that, we have to do it four times. So yeah, that's the idea is there would be kind of four unique um, outcomes here. So um, good observation, David. Thank you. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, got John Clark, Eric Reed, and then Justin Davis. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Jason, and this is really amazing work. Uh, my question has to do with the weightings. I mean, obviously, that seems to be the more subjective part of this whole uh, formula. And is the idea kind of like a uh, wisdom of the crowds where you would hope that everybody that is answering this survey is doing so independently because obviously the results could be skewed if people knew, well, take like if the board, if a faction of the board knew that if we wait this heavily, it'll work to the result we want to get. Um, just curious. Yeah, no, it's a really good point, um, John. And, and I, you know, I, I think you're right. You could, so, the first thing I'll say is that's kind of the idea by doing this stuff independent of the management action. It allows more objectivity, um, you know, within the overall process. Yes, this is absolutely, it's subjective. It's the, um, it's the part that the board really applies its policy desires on the tool, on the decision tool. So that's kind of, it's subjective, but is also reflective of the commission's policy or the board's policy, um, you know, meaning we want to have really high weight on the technical information and, and less weight on the um, economic and social information, or we want equal weights on those things. And um, so someone could game it. I suppose it's, I, I think there could be things within it that would have counterintuitive effects. So I, I guess I would suggest that people should take the survey and, and be truthful and sincere in taking the survey because what they think they might be gaining in the system might backfire on them. So I, I guess I'll, I'll end my yammering there. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Eric Thanks, Reed. Jay. That, that was uh, very interesting. And as I said, you know, I, I think that if it is done in the spirit that you say, that it could be very useful. I uh, just want to follow up on the uh, economic considerations. Uh, the fact that you're weighting like short term and long term effects with a similar weight, uh, wouldn't they kind of offset themselves in some of these things? I mean, we always will say, like, well, we got to cut harvest now because it will pay off in the long run. So economically, short term pain, but long term gain. Yeah, no, really, um, really good observation, John. I think you're right that they could offset each other, but they don't have to. And there's two ways that they might not directly offset each other. Um, one would be if the weightings are not equal. So if you thought um, you know, you want to upweight the long term over the short term, that could, um, you know, create a situation where they're not always just canceling each other out. And then the other way is in the actual score. So you could have equal weightings on these things, but then the scores, depending on, you know, whatever the management objective is or management action that's being proposed, the scores could be different. Um, you know, you could get a really significant short-term effect with little long-term benefit. And so those two scores would be reflective of that and they wouldn't cancel each other out. Great, all set, John. Yeah, Great. thanks a lot, Jay, that was very interesting. Great, I've got Eric Reed, Justin Davis, and then Tom Foley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Doctor. Um, now, I, I appreciate the fact that this socioeconomic data is in there. You know, if I remember correctly, I think I have a vague memory of us of the few items we do with our partners at the Mid-Atlantic. I think there's a few. And I, I appreciate the socioeconomic data being included there, especially in relationship with National Standard 8, which addresses communities. Um, but my question is, I, I see in the presentation you talk about X vessel price and uh you know weightings and so on and so forth so where does the economic multiplier for any particular species fit into this program and do you also consider willingness to pay 
in the commercial fishing industry? Uh, awesome questions, Eric. I, you know, the current construct of these um, came from the experts on the um, Committee for Economic and Social Science as some good solid metrics that they thought um, might be a good place to start. Now, as mentioned a couple of times, I think some customization could occur within the tool itself. And so if there were other metrics or ways of looking at the existing metrics in a different way, I think those could be built in. And I think you know, that's what we are talking about with regard to you have this overarching framework that we've stepped through today in this presentation, but then you kind of get down to the species level and that's where the stuff like that you're talking about can kind of come into the tool and, and influence it. So I think the stuff you're talking about could be built in as a standalone metric or as a supplement to one of the existing four metrics that we've offered. Um, and I, you know, I think those would have to be done, right? I, I would guess the economic multipliers and effects and things like that are very different for the different species. So that's where that would come into play. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to move right along to Justin Davis and Tom Foley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for the presentation, Jason, and, and all the work by you and the work group. I've, I've followed this with a lot of interest as it's moved along. I, I think this is great. It's providing transparency and standardization to a process that I think all of us as commissioners or delegations do in our own heads when we're making management decisions, but we're all probably doing it a little different or weighing things differently. So it's it's probably a good idea to get it all out on paper and standardize it. One thought I had in, in looking at the schemes you laid out, and it's possible I missed this, but there's a point in there for input from the board, from the TC, and from the Committee on Economic and Social Science, but I'm thinking there should be a point in there where the advisory panel has some input, um, particularly when you're considering socioeconomic impacts. Um, I think that's something that we have to give our advisors a chance to weigh in on because they have context and understanding there um, that probably goes beyond what the, the board and TC have. Yeah, um, Justin, thank you very much. I, I think that's a really excellent point. I vaguely recall thinking about where the AP um, would fit into this process. And I think you've kind of put that back on the radar. So that, that's an important consideration that we'll go back and figure out. I'm guessing it comes in um, in parallel with some of the board where the board kind of comes in. I think that would be the most logical place um, for that to come in. Um, but we will address that and, and uh, come back with a response to that. Great, thank you. Um, moving along to Tom Foti. Yeah, I, I know there's a lot of work going to this tonight, but I'm always very concerned when I hear, you know, the short-term gain, you know, short-term pain, we're going to see the long-term gain. Now, I, we've been telling that to commercial and recreational fishermen for the last 30 years, and we keep cutting back on the quotas, as we've done over the last 30 years, we put more and more restrictions. And the only thing a lot of them have seen is, Commercial fishermen going out of business, recreational party and charter boats going out of business, recreational tackle stores going out of business. So the short-term pain has turned into a long-term pain for a lot of members of the industry, both commercial and the recreational fishing industries. And you know, and we wait things, and the waiting seems never to basically really look at the pain it caused those fishing communities, both fishing communities. And I have real concerns because I'm, you know. I made promises 30 years ago, and a lot of those promises that I thought would ha actually happen never did, and never saw. You know, are you, we do ask. You know, as we were said, in, as we as politicians, are we better off than we were 30 years ago? Yeah, we might have more fish in the water according to the estimates and the MRF, but as the recreational and the fishing communities 
done any better. And when you start catching 25% of what fish were catching 30 years ago, when we start in, in most species, and we just see more and more regulations, and we don't see the rebuilding of the stocks like we, we thought we would see, or because of the approaches we use are precautionary, are basically not allowed for those even increases to be separate, uh, circled through the community. So I'm always concerned when we get new models because the, the models are only as good as I learned a long time when I was going to graduate school and I was in computers and advertising and that's what my background was. It's only the surveys and the modeling you do is only good as the data you put in. And I'm still very concerned of the data that we put into all these. And especially with the new MREPS numbers causing all this pain and considerations that I'm not sure that I, those numbers are any better than the numbers we had before. So that's just my comments on it. Yeah, um, Tom, I, you know, I think that's totally fair. Um, and what I would offer you, I, I appreciate the comments. I, I hear them myself here in Rhode Island. Um, I think one of the attributes of this decision tool is you can express that you know, in here by upweighting the short-term um, effects and downweighting the long-term effects. And long-term effects, like you said, they're uncertain. I think there's a track record uh, there as well, although, um, you know, it may be different depending on the stock you're looking at. Um, but I, you, can, you can actually express your views that you just offered within the mathematics of this tool by, um, you know, adjusting the weights commensurate with that. And just one short follow-up. And if you're using to talk, I know in the last 15 to 20 years, because New Jersey thought that was, and we all thought that was one of the fish that stayed by state because unlike black sea bears, summer flounder, they don't usually migrate out and north. They usually migrate in and out of the thing that we could basically get, um, Proposal to actually do state by state management of this. And even with all the data we tried to accumulate, we always got told it was not enough. And I finally we gave up because you're spending time and effort trying to do that. You just find out you're never going to be able to do it. So maybe if this would help, I don't know. Good, good point. Thanks, Tom. Um, Bill Gorman. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the, I think Tom's points are, are very well put. It, it seems like it, it, it's very important to get a lot of the social economics right. Um, just looking at some of the more recent decisions um, on certain fisheries, you know, within the recreational community, you know, there's subsections. There's people that don't own boats. There's bucket fishermen, pier fishermen. Um, and maybe it's just a, a policy or acknowledgement the board or commission needs to acknowledge is that when we get these reports in, if there's going to be an adverse effect on a certain subsection like peer fishermen that we can reassess. Um, oftentimes, you know, we see reports and it's kind of like, well, we're at this stage of the game, we can't go back. But the report itself is lacking, you know, critical socioeconomics. Um, and I'm just wondering if that's something that this um, model has the capability of doing um, if something is missed, you know, during the um, input process. Thank you. Yeah, um, and you can kind of redirect me if I'm not actually answering the, the question you answered, but I, I think the answer is absolutely. So there's, uh, you know, this is meant to be Kind of a, an evolutionary process you know it's supposed to iterate it's supposed to in particular in the beginning you know we're going to learn as as we go we learned a lot by running through kind of the mock striped bass example and we're hoping we think it's improved a lot and um, you know, we hope it continues to evolve and so that's um, exactly how it's sort of built to progress is you know um, let's just stick with striped bass. Let's say we got to the board and, and you noticed that, hey, you, um, we've got a highly dependent shore fishing community um, and that's not identified here. And so that comment could be made and, and the tool can be adjusted uh, 
um, to account for that. So I, I think there is now we don't we want to get to a point where at some point it stabilizes and we're not adjusting it every single time because it sort of loses its effectiveness. But in, in particular, in the first couple of uses, I do see that happening. And, and sometimes that's the best way to go, right? You don't recognize some things until you're kind of confronted with them. And this process that we've outlined here allows the ability to update and, and evolve. Yeah, thank you. I think it's really critical that it, it uh, you know, just go as you were going through the presentation, it just there was a lot of um, TC involvement, I guess, a, a lack of public involvement um, to where my fear is that you know, we could continue to overlook things um, that just aren't captured in the data, which we know is, is abundant. Um, but if there's the ability to, you know, go back and reweight it and a willingness to go back and reweight it, regardless of timeline um, or, or not necessarily process, but um, to, to get a better understanding of the world of the fishery and, and of the stocks, I think it would be fantastic because on paper it looks great, um, but it's, if it's lacking the critical information, um, it just looks great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Um, is there any, I see Tom fall to your hands back up, but is, and we have a member of the public that wants to make a comment. Is there any other board members that have not spoken on this topic yet? Tom, do you have a very quick follow-up? You do. Um, Go right ahead. When he bought, when he started talking about shore base anglers, and one of the things that has really has graded me over the years is that when you look at the management measures we put in place, especially in the recreational community, we never look at the impact it has among the different sectors of the fishery. Example, every time we raise the size limit, we put shore base anglers further and further away from the resource because they do not see the same size fish as the boat anglers. And when, because they're not at most of the meetings, and we do have as a party in charter boats, which is important to the industry and everything else, but they get the squeaky wheels and we kind of lose those people on the side. And over the years, I've brought this up many times, but we've basically forced a lot of shore based anglers to be, if they want to act, actually take a fish home to eat, they're going to be poaching most of the time because they don't really see the size limit we put in. Like you fish in Jamaica Bay, with scub, you'll never catch one that's big enough to take home to eat. And so, we could weigh this more, if I am understanding this, we could give that more weight that we don't alienate that population when we do a rule? Yes, um, you know, I, I think in that specific example, um, that would come into those uh, dependent community parts of the, the socioeconomic um, aspects. Now, you know, the ability to get that granular with it, um, we'll just have to see how that how that kind of plays out because i i actually don't know if it can get that defined but the answer to your question is yes like that type of thing is directly that's where that um community dependency part comes into play great thanks for that um uh julie captain julie evans do you have a comment uh, yes, sir. Um, um, yes, I do. Um, I, I, I'm amazed at this model and appreciate it so much. And I'm also, um, I know Tom Foti for a very long time and I appreciate his comments um, as they are very true. I, I, I've been a reporter uh, in commercial and um, for higher industry um, in the past. Um, I've also been a participant um, and there's one thing I, I, I might want to remind you, well, there's two things. Um, we have more and more subsistence fishermen, as Tom was referring to, in Jamaica Bay. I'm located in Montauk. But people um, are, I think, more dependent on shore-based fishing, and not just for fun, recreation, but for food. Um, that's one thing. So um, I'd like everyone to kind of be cognizant of that fact. The other is, is that, you know, we're faced here in East Hampton 
with a project that's going to be very disruptive to the fisheries. Um, uh, our, our town leaders have gone into an agreement with a, a wind development company called Orsted, and they're going to be running a cable from Cox's Ledge um, to Wayne Scott. Julie, I'm going to ask you to stay on topic as it pertains to the risk and uncertainty policy. Well, I, I was wondering whether the risk and uncertainty policy would be considerate of the fact that this will be disruptive to fishermen and fisheries. Great. Thanks for that question. Jason? Yeah, um, I think so. I, I appreciate the question. I think it's a tricky one in that, you know, those, it would depend if that management action were somehow integrated into the commission's management process. Then things like that could be embedded in here. Now, if things are happening that are kind of outside of the realm of a commission management action, you know, that it wouldn't connect um, into this tool. Hopefully that made sense. Um, um, if I might, if, if, if people might be willing to think about this as something that might be put into this um, management tool in the future, I would certainly, uh, I think a lot of people would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, I'm going to ask staff if they can go back one slide, please, with uh, the recommendations here. So thanks for that. So the proposed next steps are using uh, using this for uh, in a for a pilot case with Tatog. Um, just want to get a sense of the policy board and the direction you were going to go. I don't think we need a motion on this, but if we have consensus, I think we can give uh, give Jason and the team what they need to start moving forward. Is there any is there anybody that would be opposed to the next steps? I'm not seeing any hands go up. Nobody's jumping in. So, Jason, um, I think you have an answer on the uh, in support for your proposed next steps. Uh, I I want to just take a step back and thank you for that. I mean, that's very comprehensive work that you've done, uh, and I think it'll be very beneficial uh, as we move forward. So, I want to uh, personally thank you for all that work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could could I have just five more seconds to thank, I'd like to thank someone also. And, um, you know, Sarah Murray has really kept this um, going. Uh, and so I just wanted to, I, I get to be the front man here and um, that's fun for me, but uh, behind the scenes, Sarah Murray has been the uh, ASMFC person who's really kept on top of this and kept it rolling. And so my thanks uh, go to her for um, a lot of, the work and keeping this moving forward. Great. Uh, thanks. Thank you for, for saying that. Uh, your thanks is also our thanks to the policy board. So uh, great, great work, great team. Thank you very much. Um, we will continue now to move right on on the agenda. Uh, the next item is review and discuss the 20. Uh, oh, hold on. I think, yeah, you know, oh, yeah, review and discuss the 2020 commissioner survey results. And I believe Deke you're in the queue to give a presentation on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, good afternoon. I think we can head over to the second slide, please, Maya. Cool, so this is a presentation of the overview. I'm going to break the analysis of the 2020 commissioner survey down into four categories. Uh, check out some whole time series trends, the lowest and highest scores for 2020, and then we'll look at the declines and increases from last year to this year. And finally, we'll uh, do a brief summary of the comments. All right, so the survey was initiated in 2009. Um, the 2020 version of the survey was um, open from January 7th through 24th, and it is composed of 16 rating questions and five comment questions. 
as I'm sure everyone who filled it out noticed, there's a new question on the 2020 survey um, asking you to rate the ACC SP products. So that's similar to science and ISFMP. All right, this slide shows the number of respondents and average scores for each year in the time series. Um, so it's pretty self explanatory. You can see both uh, categories ticked up just a little uh, from last year. All right, so this is the whole time series slide. Um, and uh, this slide describes the negative trends throughout the whole time series using a, a linear trend line. Essentially, this is the slope of the trend line across all years. So you can see these are the questions um, that have gone down um, when you fit a linear trend line to the data points. Um, and I'd also note that questions seven, eight, and nine are in italics because those were added to the survey in 2014. Okay, so now we get to the good, the good news slide. These are um, same as last slide, but um, the questions that have been going uh, trending up throughout the whole time series. And I uh, note question 14 and 15 were new to 2014, so they don't go back all the way to 2009. So um, you can see here there's a number of, of uh, of questions that are making good progress as well. So these, uh, this slide shows the lowest scores for the 2020 survey. And I would note that these were also the lowest two scores from 2019 as well. Um, and I will also note that the score for question eight, progress to end overfishing has fallen every year since 2017. Um, all right, these are the highest scores. So everything that got above an eight questions, 11, 13, 14, 15, and 16 have remained above eight throughout the time series. So those are, um, among our highest performers every year. And questions six and 10 for securing resources and engaging le legislators, while a bit noisy, um, are trending up overall in the time series as described in back in slide six. So we're gonna now talk about the uh, questions that had a score declining from last year to this year. Um, so it's pretty um, self-explanatory cooperation with federal partners, progress at, to end overfishing, our relationship with constituent partners, cooperation among commissioners and engaging our state and federal legislators all took a little Little reduction. So this uh, slide shows um, all the questions with the the a gain of over 0.1 um, on on the on the scale of one to ten. Um, these these are um, starting up top is with um, some high performers and then. Um, you know, going down, it's a pretty small increase, but um, I, I wanted to provide a complete picture here for you. All right, now we're moving into the comments. It's really tough to distill all the comments down into, into a couple slides, but uh, I tried to stack the the comments that had that were commented multiple times up top. So the for the obstacles to rebuilding fish stocks um i think you can see the climate change and environmental uh conditions were a very popular one and so was uh politics cooperation and outside interests so i think the second one and the first one both are really um getting at some of the allocation issues that we have been dealing with recently and then uh down there, there's actually some that definitely just referenced allocation. 
the most useful ASMFC products. Um, so the science is always up there and that was up there again, the meeting materials, all of Tina's great outreach project products um, and ASMFC staff and the ISFMP products are were, were some of the most noted. And then uh, Lisa Havel's Habitat Committee products uh, were, were also a pretty popular one. So thanks. Next slide. Uh, this is always a tricky one, request for additional products. And I think quota monitoring webpage has uh, been mentioned uh, for a couple of years now. Um, and, and then there's a number of other ones. I'm not gonna read through all these and they're in the meeting materials if you wanna take a closer look. So these are issues needing more attention. And once again, climate change and the environment is right up there on top. Uh, public outreach and politics and cooperation and outside interests uh, were up there. And data management in MRIP was also um, one that received a couple multiple comments. And lastly, under additional comments, this one, should make all the ASMFC staff feel good and thanks for the compliments. Um, and a lot of these had to do with Laura's shop and helping with the uh, CARES Act stuff. With that, I'll take any questions, thanks. Uh, thanks, Deke. Any questions on uh, Deke uh, around the survey? Steve Bowman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just noting the uh, the one page that had significant uh, that dealt with a number of significant reductions. Um, in looking over that page, I was just wondering um, whether you know it just seems to me that some of those things that have gone down may be an artifact of the pandemic that we're dealing with, the lack of being able to work with each other, see each other, and things like that. So I just wanted to throw that out um, for. Uh, for consideration. Thank you. Pat, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Uh, thank you. I, for some reason, I, my uh, computer is just frozen up here a little bit. Can you hear me now, Tony? Sure can. Um, you 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 kind of froze up and stop all all uh, all the audio stopped on you for a second about halfway into Steve's comments. Is do you have a do, do I need to follow up with you, Steve, on anything? I'm sorry. No, sir. I was just indicating that you know before we take those comments to uh, not to be a double negative, but negatively, um, I was just making the point that I thought that maybe some of those may have been a result of the, the pandemic that we're dealing with and the lack of. Uh, of face-to-face -face communication, whether with our constituents, whether with our uh, fellow commissioners or, or other artifacts of, uh, of that possibility. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks. I, Steve, I think that's a rule's a real good comment. Certainly we are in a very, very different time. Um, I, I looked at that survey as much more positive than, than negative. And, and as actually when I was talking to to Tony about it, she, you know, said kind of look at a look at the the scale here of of what those some of those declines are. They're just off by a bit. So um, all, overall, I see it as very positive. Uh, Joe Sabino. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Dee. Um, appreciate it when you hit us with this. There's always some interesting things in there. I think one of them to me was the our our uh, our commissioner's concern with being able to deal with overfishing. And one of the reasons why I say that is it started in 2017 that we've been saying that, and <clears throat> it really wasn't until after we received the new MRIP numbers that we saw a stock status of overfishing for, you know, two of our, our, our key species. I think before that we were dealing with depleted status and quite a few species, but maybe only a tog that had overfishing. Um, 
And yet I still had to rank it high because those are two species along with sea bass and fluke where we can't necessarily seem to manage our way out of these things since wreck discards and environmental conditions are, are such a challenge. Um, so I just wanted to put it out there that, you know, we had a curveball thrown at us in a big way with the with the new MRIP estimates, uh, changing an entire understanding of, of our time series of management, but, um, you know, still a very real concern. So thank you. Thanks, Joe, for those comments. Um, any other members of the board like to comment? I don't see any other hands going up. I know, Tony, you had a comment you wanted to make. Yep. I just wanted, you know, Deke addressed that for a couple of years now, some folks have had interest in a quota monitoring page. And it's not that we have been ignoring that suggestion. It's the difficulties that we find for the species that are left that have state by state quotas that aren't covered under the um, uh, quota monitoring page through NOAA Fisheries have a lot of confidentiality issues with them. And so we wouldn't be able to show uh, several states landings. And so we seem to be struggling with how then we would show a quota monitoring page for those species. Thanks, thanks, Tony. Um, Seeing no other hands on this, Deke, I want to thank you for pulling all that information together. That the survey, you know, sometimes when I get it, I was like, ah, the, the survey's here again already. It seems like we just did it, but I think it's important. Um, we, we have a good um, reply rate from the uh, from members of the board, and I think it's important that we do this on an annual basis to kind of keep us all on track. So, Deke, I want to thank you again. And with that, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is review state membership on species management boards. And so that's you, Tony. Floor's yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And since we moved the first half of this agenda item to Monday, we're going to go to the second part, which Bob is actually going to cover, um, which is uh, the Pennsylvania membership on the Menhaden board. Mr. Chair, is it okay if I jump right in? Uh, yes, please, please do, Bob. Sorry. I'm okay. No, I just don't know if you had any comments before I, I jumped into it. So. No, 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 no. Go, go right ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, I'll try to keep this brief, but um, the executive committee's talked about this a number of times. But I, there are a number of members of the policy board that probably haven't um, sat in on those conversations or, or sort of been caught up on, on the whole issue around Pennsylvania and uh, the Menhaden Management Board. So for those reading along in the briefing materials, page 60 of the policy board materials has a, um, a draft memo that may memorialize the decision of the policy board at the end of this process. So that's ultimately at, at the end of this conversation, the chair will likely ask you if you're comfortable with that wording and um, and if so, we can we can adopt the the language in that memo. So the quick background is in February of 2016, uh, five years ago, the policy board unanimously approved Pennsylvania's participation on the management board. Pennsylvania asked to be put on, and, and the policy board quickly and unanimously said yes, that that works out. Um, since 2016, um, Pennsylvania coincidentally. Um, fell behind on their uh, dues payments to ASMSC for a variety of reasons that have all been addressed and Pennsylvania is currently up to date and in, in great standing financially with the commission. Um, but there, when they were uh, in arrears, the executive committee um, was looking into the consequences and impacts of states being uh, behind on their dues payments. And we worked with uh, the commission's attorney, Sean Donahue, uh, to, to look into that issue and sort of figure out, all right, if the state really falls behind, well, what, what can we and what, what do we do about that? And coincident to that review, um, Attorney Donahue noticed, sort of brought to the attention of the executive committee, I think, and he, and he did this in, in, from the perspective of being a good attorney and good commission counsel and said, hey, 
you guys may have some exposure or liability here with Pennsylvania serving on the Menhaden board. And um, his rationale for that was that he went back to the guiding documents of the commission, the compact and the rules and regulations. And in the compact, there's a number of, of descriptions on how states operate and where states can and can't participate. And one of those provisions is pretty direct. And it says Pennsylvania and Vermont um, are essentially limited to participating in the commission process for um, anadromous species. So, um, so he raised a red flag and said, hey, you may want to think about this issue and should Menhaden continue to be, continue to participate on the Menhaden board and, and, you know, there may be some exposure here that the commission needs to, to think through a little bit. And so we had that back and forth conversation at the executive committee. And then as the conversation evolved a little bit, the commission also um, approved ecological reference points through the Menhaden board and the, ultimately the policy board. And as everyone knows, um, the ecological reference points sort of intimately link um, Menhaden and striped bass, striped bass obviously being an anadromous species. Um, so as the, as the conversations at the executive committee evolved, um, they, they came up with essentially what's included in this memo, which is given the, the importance and the linkage between Menhaden as a forage base and striped bass as a um, anadromous predator, um, it, it, it seems to be acceptable for Pennsylvania to stay on the Menhaden board, giving that relationship between Menhaden and striped bass. That's what's recorded in this, this memo. Uh, we, we talked through this with our attorney again, and he feels that, you know, given the sort of new direction that the commission is moving in toward uh, ecosystem management and linkages between predator and prey, he, he does not have um, remaining concern about exposure or liability at the commission feels that um, the, you know, the commission can justify keeping Pennsylvania on the Menhaden board if they choose to do so, and that does not cause significant or, or concerns to him that down the road he'll be in front of a, a judge or uh, have a case that he's not able to adequately uh, justify why Pennsylvania is participating on the Menhaden Management Board. So, um, again, the, the summary of that, my sort of long-winded background here is included in that short memo. Um, and you know, and, and the the last pair or the last item, the last bullet number four, I think is important as well, which is this this doesn't set a precedent. It is unique. It's um, sort of a one-off situation where Pennsylvania is listed in the you know as a state in the charter that has limited participation in some of our species. But given that this um, sort of direction that the commission is moving in, it, it, it seems to be okay in this one instance, but if there's other instances, we'll have to consider those individually uh, in the future. So happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chair, but that's my somewhat quick summary of, uh, of the issue. No, th thanks for that, Bob. Um, I think it's that, that bullet number four in particular, um, or item number four is particularly uh, important as far as precedent setting. Uh, the fact, I think the, the, the executive committee had a couple different conversations about this. I think the fact that um, uh, the attorney has looked at this and feels comfortable um, as well uh, with this new information, uh, it gave the executive committee some, uh, some comfort having this um, move forward, um, memorializing it with a, uh, with a memo in the file. Uh, so it's not lost in the future. But um, before we make any final decisions here, I want to open it up uh, for any uh, questions or comments to, to Bob. Um, any hands? I don't see any hands. Um, we, from a process standpoint, we do not need a motion because Pennsylvania is on the board. Um, so from my standpoint, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, we can just memorialize this with um, uh, that uh, consensus was reached on this issue and we can put this letter in the file. Yes, that's correct. We'll finalize this memo, um, you know, include today's date and I'll sign it and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be all set. I, I can obviously share it. A copy of this with all the commissioners in case they want one just to have it in their in their files but that's that's a good plan moving forward path 
Okay, that sounds good. Well, I don't see any other hands uh, on this issue or any hands on this issue. So with that, um, we will uh, we'll have this letter signed. I think, Bob, that's a good idea for as far as uh, getting this copy out to uh, everybody on the policy board. So if you guys could do that, that'd be great. All Brilliant. right. Uh, okay. Tony, I don't think you had anything else under this item. I did not, Mr. Chairman. Okay, we'll move right along because you are up next as well. So item number 11 is discuss commission process for working on recreational reform issues. Tony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have two, I guess, things to go over with the board on, on this one. And my, it's not this presentation, that'll be for the next agenda item. Sorry about that. If I gave you the wrong numbers. Um, uh, so the, the policy board has been meeting jointly with the Mid Atlantic Council on rec reform for four commission species um, summer flounders, scut black sea bass, and bluefish. Because, um, and the policy board has been involved because it is two management bodies that are management boards that are being addressed. And since the policy board is the overarching management board for all of the species management boards, uh, we thought it may, made the most sense for that this body to engage with the Mid-Atlantic Council on these rec reform issues. And at some point along the way, we said we would come back to this board and confirm that that is the way we want to move forward as management documents are initiated. And so we have initiated some management, a management document. So one, the first thing we want to do is just to confirm that it is this policy board that is should be engaging with the Mid-Atlantic Council on these issues. And then the second piece of information that we want to get um, advice from the policy board is how to move forward with voting with the Mid-Atlantic Council. And what we're looking for today is recommendations to bring back to the council as the two bodies discuss, discuss how voting would take place. Um, but we just want to get the position of the policy board before moving into those discussions with the council. So for the Summer Founders Cup and Black Sea Bass Board and the Bluefish Board, who have joint FMPs with the Mid-Atlantic Council, the process in the past, or the, the process that we use is um, making like decisions. And so if a motion is raised, each body has to have the exact same motion for that motion to be able to be voted on. And both bodies have to pass that motion for the motion to carry. Um, this is uh, a unique system that we have with the Mid-Atlantic Council for these jointly managed species. When we take on issues um, that are for species that are complementary with other management entities, such as the South Atlantic Council or the New England Council, we do not use this um, uh, like motion process. And so we are looking for recommendations on how we want to discuss the voting with the, the Mid-Atlantic Council. That's the second part. And that is my background of this discussion, Pat. Thank you, Tony. Um, questions of Tony on this issue, uh, Tom Foley. Yeah. Thank you for your hard work on that, Tony. I mean, I'm looking at, I see a serious problem here, and I'll just pick bluefish because it's, it, it basically shows the whole problem. We basically have representation from North Carolina to New York on the Mid-Atlantic Council. We have some New England representative with the, uh, uh, basically sits, I think Eric sits there as a representative of the New England Council. When we come to the South Atlantic, there is no representation whatsoever, and those states do not have the votes and on the council to basically equalize. I mean, I'm just looking at the Mid Atlantic Council can control what happens in the South Atlantic and the New England part, and some some of the member states from both New England and South Atlantic don't really like that too much. And I agree with them. There's a problem there. I don't know how we get around it. I mean, if we had a super council or a committee of the three councils that would meet on species like this, that we have a total membership of up and down the coast, 
that would make more sense. But the, basically, the mayor of Atlanta Council, as a deciding vote with a, from our six, uh, from our four members or five members below them, including Southern Men of North Carolina, and from Rhode Island North, how do we how do we correct that problem? And that's one of the things I've been trying to think about. And I think, like everything else, over this pandemic, it's actually given me more time to think about the whole process of what I've been doing. So I think that's why some of those comments on the survey were, were more interesting this year. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, thank, thanks, Tom, for, for that. Um, I've got uh, two other hands up, uh, Richie White and then David Borden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, sitting in uh, black sea bass uh, for the first time in a number of years um, and watching or participating in that process, it, it just struck me that in, in the process, the Mid-Atlantic gets to veto um, whatever the commission comes up with um, as the commission uh, <clears throat> determines votes first so they the commission would pass um a motion and then the mid atlantic council can just say no to it and I, and the concern is that um you, you know this it's obviously state waters and federal waters fishery but this to me i think is new in that it's allowing um you know a federal entity or representative of of the feds uh, control over state water fisheries, and I, you know, I don't know the answer because obviously we you know, we have to the species has to be managed in both entities. But um, I, it, it was new to me and it gives me some concern. But I, I'm not I don't have any recommendations. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Richie. I'm going to try to bring us back with some recommendations in a moment, but I'd like to uh, recognize Dave Borden and then Adam Nowoski. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm just going to follow up on both Tom's point and um, Richie's point. The, you know, over the over a long period of time, I have had my ears burned by New England fishermen about the lack of represent New England representation on the Mid-Atlantic Council. And the issue that, that really comes up uh, in my mind is the fact that the, since you need identical motions and there are no New England representatives on the Mid-Atlantic Council, then in essence, it's very difficult for the New England contingent to get a motion even on the floor. Um, so I mean, I think that that is a real problem with the system. Like Richie, I don't know how to how to uh, address it. Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, Adam Nowalski. Great. Thanks very much, and I appreciate Richie's comments. Uh, I don't know if Michael Lisi is participating today, but he'd want to comment as chair of the Mid-Atlantic Council. But I do want to highlight that the process that took place earlier this week between the joint bodies was somewhat different um, with regards to the order of voting that took place and was, in fact, requested by some uh, member states from the commission. Uh, it's typically the process when we vote on joint motions at a joint meeting that the council and the commission would alternate on a motion by motion basis which body votes first, which then essentially gives the other body that veto power. When on Black Sea Bash commercial, uh, the two bodies met jointly in December. Uh, it was determined, uh, again, at the request of, of board members uh, in consulting with leadership when we discussed the issue of inclusion of the allocations in the federal FMP. It was decided for the December meeting on that portion of the agenda that we would forego the alternating process, only have the Mid-Atlantic vote first on those options, followed by a vote from the board if the Mid-Atlantic motion passed. Uh, and then for the issue of the allocations at this meeting, it was again determined ahead of time that the board would vote first on all of these motions followed by the council. 
but our typical joint meeting process is not what you saw. We typically go back and forth. Board votes first on one motion, which gives council, as you address, uh, call it veto authority. The next motion, the council would vote first, which again, in the terminology we're using, would give the board veto authority and go back and forth on motions throughout the order of business of the day that way. So this meeting was different this week. I know it's been a few meetings since New Hampshire's been a part of that, but I did want to highlight that process. Um, thanks, Adam. Um, I'm going to go to Mike Luisi, and then I'm going to um, try to bring an idea forward. So, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Pat. I mean, so is there being is there something that's being uh, asked of? Um, you know, we've been dealing with joint meetings for quite some time, and and I and I speak not as a as a member of the policy board, but as the chair of the Mid-Atlantic Council, you know, I feel like we we try um, to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to speak and to be represented as far as the decision-making groups. Um, and, I'm, you know, I, I will say that I, I missed the beginning part of this conversation. I was on a, I was on a phone call with, with during another, uh, another meeting, but, so I don't know, Pat. I mean, is there is there ever is there something being asked of the mid? I, um, you know, maybe I well, I can ask yeah. you that question and see where we go from there. But um, I'll, I'll 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 limit my comment to that point and and see what you think. Yeah, th thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. And there there may be a question uh, asked of the mid and. I, I've been talking to staff about this, and I guess the, the one benefit of sitting up here in the northeast corner is that I've been kind of watching it from afar, um, listening to the conversations, um, both at the table and obviously the online table, I guess I should say, um, as well as um, talking to a few of the folks around the, around the virtual table, but talking to staff as well. I think we've got, we've got two issues we've got to consider. Um, the first is the, the simpler one. Is the policy board still the right board to take part in these discussions? Um, and then second, what's the voting process? Uh, does the policy board, if it is the board, um, want to recommend to MAFAC? So there may be a decision point here. Um, as it's been stated by Tony, and you know we've got two commission management boards, uh, it seems reasonable for the policy board to take part in these discussions. It was it was suggested that that would be the case. Um, and so before I go on, I just want to make sure, does the board agree that the policy board is the right uh, body uh, to continue these discussions with the mid? Um, if not, is there a is there a better process from uh, from um, who's going to be engaged in this? Does anybody object to the policy board? continuing with those discussions. And Pat, can I just clarify that we're talking about rec reform here? We're not talking about how we engage with the individual Bluefish Board and the Mid-Atlantic Council or the individual Summer Founders Club like CBS Board and the Mid-Atlantic Council. It's about rec reform issues only is what we're getting a recommendation for so then we can carry forward um, a, a recommendation to the council about how we vote together as well as is this the right body. Yeah, th thank you. Thanks, Tony, for uh, for saying that because I think th th there's still a lot of um, still a lot of energy around that Black Sea Bass issue. So thanks for kind of refocusing this on the on the rec reform issue. Does 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 the is there any objection from the from the policy board that that the policy board remains the board that will be engaged with the minute on this issue. Adam Nowalski, your hands up. Thank you. So I don't want to object to that process, but I just want to ask the question is, does the wording in the FMP allow the commission as a whole 
to be part of that joint process or for these jointly managed species? Is there something that explicitly states that joint management action takes place with one of those species specific boards? Um, in which case action as part of rec reform that might modify the FMP might need to come from the board specifically. Uh, and I don't know the answer to that, but I did want to ask. Yeah, thanks, Adam. That's a great question. I'm going to let staff jump in, but from my perspective, because this is an overarching policy around rec reform, the, the policy board is the right place. And then when it gets used at the lower levels with the species board, then that's where they become engaged. But um, Tony or Bob, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, Pat, I can jump in. You know, I, I would have said the exact same thing you said, which is the policy board is the overarching board and traditionally and our practice has been for the policy board to tackle multi-species issues or issues that span uh, more than one species management board. And, and while I'm talking really quickly, I don't, Tony may have said this in her, in her opening statement, but you know, the other unique thing with rec reform is some of our commissioners during the development of this have, have suggested that, you know, if we come up with some really good ideas in rec reform, those may be applicable to other commission only managed species, striped bass, tatog, whatever it might be. So, you know, it, and sort of part of that conversation was, you know, it seems awkward or strange maybe for the Mid Atlantic Council to be too involved if the commission's developing a, a broad policy on rec reform that may apply to species outside of the four that we jointly manage with the mid. So you know, that kind of muddies the water even a little bit more. So happy to answer questions on that if there are any. Thanks, Bob. Um, Mike Luisi. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. So, I mean, yeah, I think honestly, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of of the council at this point um, as chair of the council. And, you know, I think you, Pat, I think you, Bob, Tony, and I, Chris Moore, we need to just have a conversation about how we're gonna, how we're gonna, um, you know, work forward with the, with this rec performance uh, initiative. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, to I'm, I'm willing to, to have that conversation with you guys uh, to try to figure out where you know how we're going to operate um so that we don't find ourselves in a position where the decisions that we make are, are questioned um to the point where whether the commission or the or the council you know votes in a particular way um i just th i just think that we we need to be transparent in how we're going to handle the handle that down the road Right now, it's 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 all kind of theoretical, and you know, we're, you know, there's a lot of good work to be done. But at some point, there's going to be motions made, and uh, we just need to figure that out. So, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I, I I agree that we're going to have to have more discussions on this, and and I noticed I note that there's a couple other hands um, that have gone up, and I'll and I'm going to come to you in a second, but I do want to put an idea on the table for the policy board's consideration, and I think it would fit into that broader conversation um, that you just referenced, Mike. Um, you, you know, T Tony Tony discussed this earlier as far as the joint management process where we need to have like motions between the commission and the council. You know, if you if sitting up here in the Northeast, I, I looked at that process um, and it certainly does give the mid kind of more voting power the way it is currently set up. Um, Adam brought up this idea about kind of switching back and forth on who gets v potential veto power. Uh, what in talking to staff, what we've come up with is potentially an idea that kind of removes that kind of veil of veto power and what I'd like to do is suggest that um, as far as rec reform decisions are made, like motions would not be required as they are in a joint management process to vote on issues. And while this could potentially mean separate documents and final decisions, it preserves an equal voting voice in power among the states as it's intended under Act FACMA. So a little bit more work. Um, two sets of documents, but after those things are done, then it would be trying to bring these things together um, uh, to try to resolve. But it, it just felt better than trying to 
see one body having veto uh, power over another. So that's that's the thinking that I that has evolved with with staff and myself. Um, again, I'm kind of looking at it from a distance, but um, we have those two issues: the policy board and in, and this type of decision making, a new type of decision making process. So um, I've got two hands up. Um, um, I, Karen Abrams, your hand went up earlier. Do you did you still have a question, or you did your question get answered? Uh, I put my hand down. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, I have um, a bunch of hands going up now. Uh, I'm going to start with um, uh, Tom Foti, Eric Reed, Jim Gilmore, Joe Semino, and Michael Easy. Thanks, Pat. Um, I have confidence in the commission. I mean, we have a lot of checks and balances that the councils do not have. When you vote as a caucus vote, you have to get a legislator, a state state director, and the governor's appointee all agree on a vote. Otherwise, you wind up with a null vote, or you wind up with an abstention, or we wind up voting for an issue. But it also breaks sure that we basically cover all whether you're commercial or recreational, it doesn't make you got to, you've got to work with your other two commissioners so you all work together on getting into a consensus of what should be done for both all your fishermen in the state. The councils are set up a little differently. You know, I know they're supposed to represent all the fishermen and look at it, uh, you know, beyond whether you're commercial or recreational. By after dealing with the council for 35 years, I've noticed that that doesn't happen much. And that's why I have confidence in the way the commission deals with these issues. Sometimes New Jersey's on the short end of the stick. We've been there a couple of times. But at least I know I'm dealing with three commissioners that have to caucus together to bring out a decision. And I always respect it and, and still respect that process to no end. And will defend that process. And I do not feel the same way as I've been watching the council system operate over the last couple of years. It's gotten more, oh, partisan to how you how you feel about it you know how it affects you not how it affects your state and i think that's where we we suffer we do the best job at, at, at doing this so i really and i want to compliment the commission for the job it does because that's what it does best okay thank you tom eric reed yeah thank you mr chairman uh i i do appreciate this this particular piece of guidance and i think uh, I'm fine with the policy board handling it. Um, you know, I, I am the liaison from New England and the mid to the Mid Atlantic, and Chair Chairman Luisi and Dr. Moore give me a lot of latitude. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm not voting. Can't do it. Can't do a lot of things. But uh, and that that's not very comfortable. And I've mentioned in every meeting there is sooner or later. How the New England position is diluted in, a, in the process, even joint with the ASMFC. So if that helps uh, still the diluted mess down a little bit, I'm 100% for it. Thanks, Eric. Um, I was going to say something about we all give you a lot of latitude, but I'll, I, I won't say that. Uh, next on the list is Jim Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you can hear me okay? Loud and clear, Jim. Great. Um, I, I think, Pat, your suggestion, and first off, yeah, the policy board's the right place to do this. And your suggestion of trying to do this, I think uh, some, you know, agreement between the commission and the council, I think is a good start. Uh, because if we can resolve this at the uh, lowest level, I think that, you know, we'll, we'll give it a try and, and maybe we can come up with something that works. Uh, my concern with it, though, is um, well, and it really comes down to how the councils were formed, which is now 45 years ago when Magnuson was passed. And I don't think Magnuson envisioned a lot of things, uh, maybe that the fishers are going to be more static than they are now. And, and I've mentioned this before, a few years ago, we all went down to D.C. And the one thing that came out of that that was clear, that was the governance based upon the structure of the council was problematic for what we're dealing with, with uh, stock shifting around. So, um, and I, unfortunately, I, I think the, um, 
if we really want to try to fix this beyond your suggestion, Mr. Chairman, it, it, I don't know if, if the statute that originally created Magnuson is going to allow for that. So um, I guess we'll have to deal with it. But I think it's a good suggestion. Let's try to do this in a cooperative effort with the council. And then if it doesn't work, we'll have to maybe do some more serious options. So thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Joe Semino. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I, I support the policy board's uh, involvement in this. And I, at first blush, your suggestion that um, for rec reform, like motions aren't needed sounds reasonable to me. I know a lot of us fear that the biggest challenges to some of those very good ideas in, in rec reform will be strict interpretation of Magnuson. So as the commission develops an overarching policy for other species, uh, that may not be an issue, but I do worry about those species that are jointly managed. Um, at times the council has to, for certain species like sea bass and fluke will come up with non-preferred options, kind of nuclear options. If Noah's too concerned uh, that the that the options being chosen are not risk averse enough. And I would worry that if council and commission are making different decisions for state waters on jointly managed species, that it, it could put the council in, in a tough position at times. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Joe. Um, Mike Luisi, back to you. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. So, I, yeah, Joe just, you know, Joe just, summarized where I was kind of going. So, I mean, do you think there's an opportunity for the policy board? And so I guess my question to you, Mr. Chairman, is at what point are we going to make a decision on this? Um, is today the day to make a decision about whether or not the the policy board and the council don't have to have like motions in moving forward with rec reform. I mean, my opinion would be that um, I, I don't think that's the that's the right way forward. I think if we're going to do something, you know, at the federal level um, and with the council, that we do it together. Um, but. You know, I guess I'm I'm looking for some advice or or some guidance from from your end um, as to when. I mean, yeah, it's it's part of the discussion today, but do we need to have a more more thorough, um, more informed conversation? You know, between now and when a decision gets made, I'm just I'm just looking for you to you for some advice at, at you know as to how that how that. How you think the the uh, the commission's going to work through this? Yeah. So um, so as I was thinking about this, um, you know, a little, a little spitballing here, but you you made a comment earlier, Mike, uh, as it pertains to um, um, leadership getting together. Um, I I think. There's likely agreement around the table now that the policy board is the right board uh, from a commission standpoint. So maybe what we need to do from this point is take this concept that I laid out, have leadership for both mid um, uh, and the commission get together to kind of work on that that concept. Uh, you know, just in the spirit of cooperation, see where we go from there. But um, I, I wouldn't mind getting. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, wouldn't mind getting Tony or Bob's thoughts on that as well. Mr. Chairman, I think you hit the nail on the head. It was the intent here. We knew that this discussion needed to happen and we wanted to know what it was that this body wanted us to bring forward in those discussions. We didn't want to speak for you. We wanted to know how you guys wanted to carry out actions. And so if we have that recommendation from this body, then we can take that to leadership. And I see that Bob has his hand up as well. So we'll let him take the reins from here. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I agree with, with where you're going, Pat, and Tony's comments. You know, I, only thing is sort of responding to Mike's questions on timeline and when when do these decisions need to be made? 
Um, we don't have to do it today necessarily. We can we can have a leadership call, but I think we need to decide pretty soon because the rec reform schedule is ambitious to say the least. And there, you know, we're going to have to have a number of meetings uh, throughout the remainder of this year to try to get that done and, and maintain that schedule. So we'll need to figure something out, whatever whatever it looks like, pretty quick. Okay, Mike, does that make sense to you? This approach? Um, yeah. I can't, uh, let me just make sure I'm not on mute. Um, yeah, I mean, so I think that the sooner the better. I mean, I'm going to be working out of my kitchen for the next <laughs> for the next year probably. Um, yeah, I I'm I'm willing to have the conversation uh, with with leadership from ASMFC and the council. You know, anytime you guys want to plan it. But I do think that. So what what I'd like to see is a discussion um, that gets brought back to the policy board. The problem with the, the problem is Bob, Bob and, and Pat, you guys, there's not another policy board meeting until, until May. So that like the um, spring meeting that going to be the next time the policy board gets, gets together, or could you, could you do something in between now and May? I think there's a possibility with a webinar to do something between now and May. Um, Bob, just, wouldn't, I'd, I'd uh, hate for I'd hate for a delay. Yeah, yeah, I think you know, as Bob said, I agree, Mike. As Bob said, I mean, the, the, there's an ambitious schedule that's laid out here, so I think we may have to come back around to this um, uh, unless the policy board wants the executive committee to deal with it directly. Um, I think the first step is let's let's get as long as there's agreement from uh, the policy board. Now we agree that the policy board is the right body. Leadership gets together with the mid to um, kind of work on this concept that I laid out uh, to see if it is the right way to go, and then we make a determination, um, uh, yes or no, and bring that back to the policy board for. For final adoption, we may be the, we may be able to do it with an email vote, or if it's needed, we may be able to pull together a webinar. But Bob, I'll let you jump in. Yeah, thanks, Pat. I was going to say the same thing that that a webinar between now and May, you know, we can find an hour and a half or so to uh, to bounce this off the policy board. I would think, unless unless the policy board wants to delegate the authority to the executive committee, and that's up to uh, the group. That's on the phone right now, or on the on the webinar. Um, I've got one new hand. That just I, I, Tom Foy, I see our hands up. I'm going to actually go to Roy Miller, who has not made a comment on this. Um, Roy, go ahead. Thank you, Pat. I would just suggest that the that we stick to the policy board rather than the executive committee. If it's if it's the executive committee then we lose a lot of potential participation from LGAs. Um, right now, only uh, Dennis Abbott and I uh, represent the LGAs on the, on the executive committee. And so I, I think everyone should be kept abreast of what develops uh, with this rec reform issue and uh, um, Joint voting with the Mid Atlantic Council representation, et cetera. My opinion. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, Roy. I think uh, I think it's a it's a solid opinion as well. Um, Tom Foti. I was just going to say what, what Roy was going to say. Also, the fact that we need to really do it so we can get the LGAs to basically at these meetings. You know, it's hard for people. To, you know, with the schedules, even though a lot of us are at home. It's hard for some people that still have to work scheduling in between teaching their kids and everything else. So they really need to have these meetings scheduled at a certain time and give it not when it's a council meeting, maybe not when it's a commission meeting. So it's good for all of us. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, I've got two other new hands that have gone up. Um, I've got Double O, Dennis Abbott. Dennis, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. I agree with Roy. Neither him or I would be prepared to properly represent the LGAs in this issue. Their voices need to be heard individually. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. David Borden. 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I totally agree with your suggested way forward, um, and I, I think it's logical, and uh, I, I think it's uh, in the best interest of the commission. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, seeing no other hands, um, uh, unless somebody wants to object, the policy board will continue to be um, uh, the body that will move this forward. Um, I agree with the comments um, as far as bringing this back around to the policy board and not the executive committee. Uh, and um, uh, we will reach out, uh, staff will reach out to leadership of the mid and we'll get meetings set up as soon as possible. Uh, figure out what uh, the time constraints going to be on that, and then we will report back out to the to the policy board um, on how those discussions are going and if we're going to need a, a meeting to adopt anything. Um, if, if there's any objections to that, um, please raise your hand. If not, we're going to uh, we're going to move this conversation along to the next item. Great, thank you very much. It was a good conversation and. Um, Moving along on the agenda, uh, item number 12, which is Tony again, discuss possible reporting programs to capture recreational date release data. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And now Maya, that presentation you had had up before is ready. Um, so this is a bit of a follow-up from the Bluefish Board discussion. And Maya, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, that was had earlier today and as well back in December when we met jointly with the Mid-Atlantic Council. So I'll just briefly cover sort of the background. In a recent review of the biological reporting requirements, the Bluefish TC had noted that the stock assessment recommendation to accurately characterize the recreational release links is very integral to the assessment and improvements to the methodology used to collect this data is recommended. You heard this today at the, the Bluefish board meeting. The TC discussed options for reporting that could be used for electronic reporting that could be used for collecting recreational angler release data to remove the need for states to create their own individual data collection systems. The TC at that time had recommended the Bluefish Board advance the importance of broadly collecting reliable recreational release length frequency, frequency data for all recreational species by asking the Bluefish Board to, task the, uh, to ask the Policy Board to task the Assessment Science Committee to work with ACCSP to develop a comprehensive program for reporting release fish of all recreationally important species to the, that the commission manages. The Bluefish Board had concerns about the lack of specificity in the recommended task and weren't prepared to do so. And so what we said was that uh, staff would put together some information for the policy board to um, think about in terms of recreational discard data collection and um, provide some recommendations to the policy board instead of going to this specific task. And so, Maya, if you go to the next slide, um, there are a lot of different elect electronic reporting apps out there. Um, in the past, some are currently some concerns have been raised when discussing reporting apps uh, that produce population uh, level estimates of recreational catch. A large portion of anglers would have to consistently use them to report accurate information about their fishing trips and a statistically valid probability-based sampling survey would also have to validate self-reported data, monitor the extent of the reporting, and account for unreported trips. But opt-in or non-mandatory angler reporting, reporting apps have been found useful in some cases for collecting quantitative data via citizen science incentives. For example, the Florida Snook and Gamefish Foundation anglers working with Florida Fish and Wildlife uh, assessment scientists to collect and use angler data in stock assessments. However, in most cases, the lack of comprehensive data collection and validation has limited the use of that data in stock assessments. Um, but there, um, and so, but there are uh, aspects of these opt-in non-mandatory angler reporting apps that can be used for other, other information. 
and some of these reporting apps that are currently being, are being used, but none are completely comprehensive for the entire East Coast. A couple of examples are the SCAMP release program. Previously, it was only used for SCAMP, but that program is adding other snapper grouper species in April of 2021. Uh, the MyFish count focuses on South Atlantic species. It has 23 species that can be reported through this app, but not bluefish. Um, iSnapper collects, uh, focuses on snappers, but in Gulf waters. And ACCSP is currently developing SciFish. Um, this product is a combination of Scamp Release and Catch You Later, which is from North Carolina DMF. It focuses on 10 grouper species, plus flounder, spotted sea trout, weakfish, kingfish, and red drum. Um, ACCSP is um, in the process of conducting scoping meetings for the SciFish application that will expand the features and standardize the data collection. Um, the medium to long-term goal is to expand this application so that it can be customized for many different species. Uh, there will be a questionnaire that is going to be distributed on February 8th, and there will be town hall meetings on March 9th and 11th. And you can contact Julie Simpson at ACCSP for more information on these meetings. Um, and so it's our staff recommendation that instead of having the commission develop a specific program themselves, that commission staff and um, assessment science committee continues to engage with ACCSP as they develop SciFish. Um, AC, uh, the assessment science committee continue to receive updates and advise and communication with the rec tech leads to this specific program. And the comments and information that we can provide back to ACCSP would be rel relative to information that would be useful for commission managed stock assessments and um, management activities. Uh, we thought that this would be a more streamlined approach to trying to bring into the data needs for our stock assessments instead of trying to recreate the wheel. And that is all I have here and I can answer questions and I also have some backup folks for questions that I cannot answer. And I'm not really looking for an action here, I was just trying to provide a, a different path forward from the Bluefish TC's recommendation, but still find ways that we can collect this information. It might not be this year that these applications are ready for, um, for Bluefish, but perhaps in the few next coming years. Thanks, Tony. I've got uh, a couple hands up already for questions. Uh, Jim Gilmore and then John Clark. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, Tony, just a couple of questions, and I agree. I think uh, the going with the ACCSP approach with SciFish, although it sounds like a, a, a cable channel, um, just the a couple of questions. Is there what will it, I'm assuming this would be an app that they would develop and is will there be a fee associated with it and and i think we should go with it because i know um we've we hitched our wagon to a couple of things like pocket ranger and 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 fish rules uh that was a freebie to get you know information in and now they're all coming back looking for sig significant amounts of money now to keep the thing going so um yeah i think it makes sense to do our own thing but um what would it cost and is this developing our own app thanks I need to phone a friend for this, Mr. Chairman. I would ask that Jeff or Julie answer this question, one of them. Yeah, go ahead. Just uh, remember you only got three lifelines. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. This is Jeff. Um, just confirm you guys can hear me on this headset. You're all set, Jeff, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, in terms of availability to the anglers developing it in-house there's already um, plans for the development cost for SciFish for 2021 uh, those are two ACCSP approved projects uh, the cost to use these apps out in the field is of course nothing to the anglers and then 
the ongoing thought of what would it cost to support this interact with the anglers and that thing or points well taken uh mr gilmore and it, the long-term costs have not been fully identified Great, thanks, Jeff. Um, I see Julie had her hand up too. Julie, did you have something on that topic? I'm going to go with what Jeff said. Ah, perfect, excellent. Uh, John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just uh, along the lines of what Jim was just bringing up about the cost, I, I was approached by one of the uh, three uh, applications that Tony mentioned, and they did want a pretty sizable uh, payment to provide it to anglers in Delaware, you know, for Delaware Fish and Wildlife to pay for it. So if we get something that doesn't cost, that'd be great. Thanks, John. Any comment on that, Tony? Not beyond what Jeff provided. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, Jim Gilmore, your hands back up. Follow up. No, it's Chairman. I'm just sleeping. I got to put it back down. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Now, I, I should have done that myself. I, I They gave me control, which is always dangerous. Um, I don't see any other hands up at this time. Um, oh, well, I take that back. Bill, Gore, Bill Gorham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, sent the email to Mr. Beal yesterday and it looked like um, and the, there's line items for the most recent budget of 3.5 million to go to help the states implement such a plan. Um, I would be really interested to see if you were to just put this out to the public, how many apps we could probably get for relatively free, um, just given the angler feedback and frustration um, but I, I would love to see it happen and if you have to go through appropriate channels and that seems to be the fastest way, I would love to see this go through. Great. Thanks, Bill. Um, Tony, you're not looking for a motion here. What do you, what do you need from uh, the policy board? I don't need really anything. It was more of a informational update and a different route to a rec a different solution slash recommendation to what the bluefish board had started to talk about back in december great well um there's no hearing no objections um you did get some feedback so i think uh commission staff should move forward and engage with uh, with ACCSP on that, and uh, I'm assuming you'll bring bring those conversations back to the policy board at the next meeting. I'm not sure it'll be at the next meeting, Pat, but we'll keep you updated on the progress of the application, and we'll go from there. All right, that sounds good. Perfect. Um, great. Um, moving right along on the agenda, we have committee reports. Uh, we've got Habitat Committee up first, so Lisa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, Maya, do you mind bringing up my presentation? Great. I'm going to start with ACFIP since we don't have any action items for this one. Next slide. Um, the steering committee met virtually November 9th and 10th, and we discussed the National Fish Habitat Conservation Through Partnerships Act. This was um, signed by President Trump at the end of October, and it codifies NIFHAP into law. There are some major changes for how the par partnership operates um, that goes along with this act and how it administers funding. And we're hopefully spending this year, 2021, to figure out this implementation collectively. We also had updates on current on the ground projects funded by the Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA Recreational Fishing, as well as NOAA GARFO and the Fish America Foundation. And we discussed the finalized conservation mapping project that I've presented to you all in the past. And the funded projects and conservation mapping projects are on the ACFIP website under the Our Work tab if you wanted to see more. Next slide. For FY 2021 Fish and Wildlife Service on the ground conservation funding, 
We received 14 applications this year and we will be recommending 11 for funding. We received proposals from seven states in the North, Mid and South Atlantic subregions. And these proposals would improve tidal vegetation, riverine bottom and shellfish bed priority habitats and benefit species such as shad and river herring, Atlantic sturgeon, striped bass, American eel, horseshoe crabs, and more. And usually the Fish and Wildlife Service announces which projects are funded in the late spring. Next tab. We also endorsed a couple of projects since my last presentation to the board back in August. The first one is the Big Pine Key Aquatic Habitat Hydro Hydrological Restoration Project. This is co-led by Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and it's taking place on Big Pine Key in the Florida Keys. It will restore 108 acres of freshwater marsh, 28 acres of mangrove forest, and 16 acres of salt marsh to provide fresh water to threatened and endangered species in the Florida Keys National Key Deer Refuge. Next slide. Another project that we endorsed was evaluating an approach to long-term SAV monitoring in North Carolina. This is led by the Albemarle Pamlico National Estuary Partnership. As I said, it takes place in North Carolina, and this is in support of an RFP for the National Estuarine Research Reserve Science Collaborative. And this project, if funded, will evaluate the effectiveness of recommended protocols for a North Carolina coast polyhelene seagrass monitoring and assessment program and ACFIP serves on the advisory panel for this project. Next slide. And finally, the last project that we endorsed was Tuckerton Reef. And this project is led by Stockton University and takes place in Little Egg Harbor Bay, New Jersey. It is a research and restoration project on a constructed oyster reef, and they're hoping to expand the reef um, as well as do some research on it. Well, it will improve water quality and provide fish habitat and it involves state, local, NGO, academia, and industry partners. Next slide. ACFIP would like to thank ASMFC um, for your continued operational support as usual. And I'll move on to the Habitat Committee report and um, I'll take questions about ACFIP uh, at the end, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, ne great, next slide. The Habitat Committee met virtually November 12th and 13th, and we received updates on the documents in progress, the acoustic impacts to fisheries and fish habitat, as well as the Habitat Hotline. The Habitat Hotline was released at the end of December and focused on fish and fish habitat assessments along the coast. We also continued working on the fish habitats of concern. We've been making good headway with that project. And we had a discussion on dredge windows elimination proposal in the Army Corps Wilmington District. And I'll get into that a little bit more next. Next slide. Um, we included in the supplemental materials a comment letter um, about the dredging windows. And in August, the Army Corps of Engineers proposed to eliminate existing hopper dredging windows in portions of Wilmington Harbor and Moorhead City Harbor so that maintenance dredging and bed leveling can occur year round with offshore or near shore placement of dredge material. In December, the Army Corps addendum limits this proposal, which was originally put out in August, to a three year period ending at the end of December 2023 and commits to studies on the impacts, but these studies are yet to be specified. Next slide. The purpose of eliminating the window is to maximize flexibility to obtain contract dredges for maintenance dredging. The current window is from December 1st to April 15th and has been in place for over 20 years in order to minimize impacts to fishery resources migrating between the ocean and vital nursery habitats. The Habitat Committee was concerned with this decision. Um, concerned for both the immediate impacts on ASMFC managed species in North Carolina as well as the precedent it sets for the rest of the coast. Next slide. The comment letter that was included in the supplemental materials um, for your consideration, it includes references to other agencies and organizations that have made comments on this um, EA, and it elaborates on specific ASMSC managed species that this um, decision could impact. 
The draft letter was presented to the executive committee in early January, but it was updated to include information from the addendum. And um, action is needed to approve the letter if the policy board so decides. Um, and I'm not sure if you would like to discuss action on the letter now or at the end of my presentation. Let's, let's do it at the end. Okay, great, I'll continue. Um, and finally, for the Habitat Committee, there were a couple of updates to membership. We have a couple of new members. Robert LaFrance is representing Connecticut. Claire Enterline is representing Maine, and we're very excited about both of these members because um, Connecticut and Maine haven't been represented for a few near years now on the committee. And um, Trip Bolton is representing Fish and Wildlife Service for the Southeast Region, replacing Wilson, Wilson Laney's position, um, and Wilson is now representing North Carolina Coastal Federation. We have a new chair, Jimmy Johnson from North Carolina, and a new vice chair, Russ Babb from New Jersey. Next slide. And I'll move on to the Artificial Reef Committee report. The Artificial Reef Committee usually meets around now, but um, we decided to meet later in the year with the hopes of possibly meeting in person. If not, we will meet virtually, but we decided to have a little hope <laughs> for that. Um, but in the meantime, next slide. The committee drafted an update to the ASMFC Profiles of State Artificial Reef Programs and Projects, which was published in 1988. And this update highlights some of the accomplishments of artificial reef programs in the states over the last 30 plus years. It summarizes the number of permitted sites, mitigation reefs, and average annual operating budget along the coast. It has an introduction and information for each state that has an artificial reef program. Next slide. For each state, there's a summary table and contact information, as well as a map of the reefs pre-1988 and post-1988. There's a summary of the state's program since 1988, and some of the highlights over the past 30 years. States have chosen to identify specific reefs, um, different successes in monitoring or collaborations. And this um, update will also include photos once the text is approved by the policy board, if you so decide to approve it. Next slide. So for this document, which was included in the briefing materials, we're seeking approval of the document text to go ahead with the formatting and the publication of this um, update. And final slide. As always, we welcome the suggestions for action items that you would like for the Habitat and Artificial Reef Committees to work on. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions or comments on the two um, requests for approval for the documents. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Appreciate that. Uh, uh, there, and before we get to the letter, approval of the letter, is there any questions of Lisa? John Clark. Thanks for the presentations, Lisa. Uh, very interesting. I just had a question about that Tuckerton Reef in New Jersey. Uh, you said it was going to be a constructed oyster reef. What material will that be made from? Is it still going to use shell or is it going to be something different? I believe that it is a combination of, um, I think it's seeded reef balls, but I can follow up with you. Um, if I go back and look at the proposal for you. So there's already a reef there and then they're looking to expand upon the, the reef that's already there. Thanks. Any other questions? Seeing none, Lisa, can you just do a very quick overview of the letter? I think a lot of people um, are aware of the letter and the issue, but can and, and just give it a couple minutes, um, and then um, we need to move to take make a uh, take action and improve it. Uh, as long as there's no objections, obviously. Um, sure. So the the letter contains first background information on the commission and um, the a little bit of background on the EA that the Army Corps put out as well as the addendum that they put out in December. And so the letter would be 
commenting on something that was already decided, but we have found in the past that even if the window for comments has closed, they do take what the commission has to say um, into consideration. Um, and then it's it's specifically calls out the different species that are likely to be impacted by the Wilmington District's um, specific proposal, including alewife, American eel, shad, croaker, menhaden, striped bass, sturgeon, black drum, blueback herring, hickory shad, red drum, spot, spotted sea trout, and weakfish. So um, there's a potential for a lot of impact since a lot of these species migrate between the ocean and the nursery habitat. So we call that out in the letter. Um, we also describe the um, the different, we acknowledge the other agencies that have commented already, and then we have um, an, an attachment that lists all the species that I just um, mentioned, as well as who manages it, whether it's ASMFC or it's jointly managed with the council, and then um, under which fishery management plan it falls under as well. So it's in total five pages, and that includes the attachment of the list of species. Great. Thank, thank you, Lisa. Uh, Joe stamino has got his hand up. Joe? Thanks, Mr. Chair. And I, 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 just to get back to John Clark's question so Lisa doesn't have to follow up later, it's all going to be sped on shell for the Tuckerton Reef, John. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Um, back to the letter. Um, is there any objections uh, from the policy board to sending that letter? Jim Gilmore. Uh, not an objection. Just um, when Lisa went through the species, I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't hear all of them, but um, it was all of our managed species. But is there any mention of uh, endangered or threatened species in that? Because that's a lot of the windows we have up in our core district. They tend to pay attention to, uh, um, you know, Atlantic sturgeon, things like that, and the rest of the species they were always fighting with them on. So is, are they included in the letter? We kept the letter focused on only species under ASMFC jurisdiction and those that occur within the geographic range, which includes Beaufort and Cape Fear River inlets, since that's what the um, the proposed EA would um, impact. And but we do express the concern that this could set precedent for other um, districts along the coast that also fall under the commission's geography. Great, thank you, Lisa. I know the, I know the precedent setting issue is uh, certainly what's important to uh, to my state. So, um, if there is no objections, um, I think we can just say that there is a consensus that the letter would be sent. And seeing no hands, I think we can get that letter out uh, by the end of the week. Great, thank you very much, Lisa. Great, thank you. Um, moving along, item number 14 is review non-compliance findings and, um, oh, Jim, your hand went back up. Did you just forget to put it down or? No, no, I just had a, a quick follow-up, at least on artificial reefs. I saw in New York, it says we have our annual budget is zero. You can make that 750,000 now and the actual price last year was 10 million, but I don't think I'm getting that this year, Bo, just if you want to include that update. Thanks. Uh, okay, thank you. I'll, I'll make that edit. And uh, Mr. Chair, is it okay to um, have a discussion on the the update to the artificial reef profiles as well to get that approved? Oh, yes, please. Yes. Um, is, is there anything else you want to bring forward on that? Any objections I, to I, that approval? I don't hear any objections, Lisa, so I think you're all set on the artificial reef proposal as well. Great. Thank you, Mr. Great. Um, moving along to item number 14 is review non-compliance findings, and we have none, uh, which is always good, uh, which brings us to the last agenda item, which is item number 15. We do have um, uh, some letters that need to be approved. Uh, so I'm going to ask the first, I'm going to go to Dan McKernan uh, to discuss the letters that were brought forward in the uh, lobster management board discussions. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Pat. Um, there are uh, three letters that uh, came out of the Lobster Management Board. Uh, the first one had to do with the National Marine Fisheries Service recent uh, biological opinion on uh, the, the bundled biological opinion uh, concerning the impacts on endangered species and notably right whales. Uh, the second is uh, a, a, a comment letter on the proposed take reduction plan rules and the draft environmental impact statements. Uh, that particular uh, comment period is open until the end of February. Then the third is uh, a letter concerning the Northeast Canyons and the Seamount. Uh, Department of Interior is mandated by President Biden to comment on whether to amend uh, President Trump's executive order, which uh, allowed fishing uh, within the uh, that particular monument. And uh, so we, we hope that the policy board would approve a letter uh, or three letters, uh, one on each item. And I believe there's some text, uh, some motions that can be brought up to the screen. Yeah. Um, did you have anything that you were going to show us, Tony, or did you want to? Maya is working on just getting those motions up on the board for you guys to see. For all, Great. Well, two different motions. I have them on separate slides. Do you want me to put them all on one slide? Um, I think let's, um, that's one, I mean, that one slide fills the screen with the first letter. Um, this does not need, Dan, you want to just read that into the record? It does not need a second because it's a motion that's coming from the board. I certainly can. Uh, on behalf of the Lobster Board, move the commission send letters to NOAA Fisheries with comments on the proposed rule to amend the regulations implementing the Atlantic Large Whale Take Reduction Plan and the draft biological opinion. The biological opinion letters should include the following. Uh, first, the biop should be completed, so it will support the proposed rule to avoid jeopardy. Uh, second bullet, a statement that addresses the burden the U.S. fishery could bear based on the actions of Canada. Uh, the Atlantic Large Whale Take Reduction Plan letter should include the following. The rules should not, I'm sorry, the rules should be completed by the end of May to ensure the court does not intervene. Uh, implementation timeline recommendations that address practical start dates. Uh, supporting uh, trial equivalency. Uh, I think that may be a typo there. Uh, that would allow for modifications related to trial lengths, such as to address the need to fish a single end line in areas. Example, eight traps lines equals four traps with one end line and finally to support enforcement and coordination with state agencies great thank you dan um that is the uh motion on the table it does a uh, motion on the floor it does not need a second coming from the board uh david borden yeah thank you mr chairman i totally support um the uh commission submitting a letter the only only thought i've had since is um, we have two um, deadlines, one for the biop um, and the other one uh, for the proposed rule. One is uh, February 19th and the other one is March 1st. And it might make some sense uh, to request a minor extension in the comment period on the biop. Uh, and I, I um, so that both comment periods end on March 1st. I don't think that will delay anything with, at NOAA, uh, but uh, in terms of how to handle it, Mr. Chairman, I'm prepared to make that as a motion to amend, or we could do it as a stand a standalone motion, whatever you prefer. Yeah, David, thanks. I think what I'd like to do is um, vote on this motion and then bring that up as a standalone motion. Uh, let's do that after we take care of the uh, the monument, this letter and the monument letter. Um, Thank you. Uh, Karen Abrams. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Karen Abrams, NOAA Fisheries. I, I certainly have no um, objections to this motion, uh, but I, I'm going to abstain from this vote. Okay, thank you very much for that, Karen. Um, any objections to the motion? Noting the one abstention from NOAA Fisheries and hearing no objections, the motion passes. If we could put the next letter uh, motion up on the board for the second letter. 
Dan, it's, you've got the floor again. Sure, thank you. Uh, move to request the commission send a letter to NOAA requesting a short extension of the comment period on the Endangered Species Act Section 7 consultation biological opinion from February 19th to March 1st, 2021. Uh, well, that was that was not the, the yeah. Um, no. Could we put up the, um, let's put a hold on that. That was the motion that David was gonna make. Um, Maya, you should have another letter or another motion from the lobster board on the monument. There it is right there. There you go, Dan. Okay. Uh, uh, regarding the monument, on behalf of the lobster board, move the commission send a letter to the Secretary of Interior, restating the commission's position on modifying the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument. Great, thank you very much. Um, is there any objections to the motion on the board? Does not need a second. Karen, I assume you will be abstaining again. Am I correct on that one? Yes, that's correct, Mr. Chairman. And as well, Mike, as well. our, Mike, I assume you'll be abstaining? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, noting that both NOAA and U.S. Fish and Wildlife will be abstaining, are there any objections to the motion? Hearing, see, hearing and seeing none, uh, the motion passes. Thank you, Maya. Maya, if you could put that other motion back up, I think that's the motion that David Borden was going to make. David, if you wanted to read that into the record. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I move to request the commission send a letter to NOAA requesting a short extension on the comment period on the Endangered Species Act Section 7 cons consultation biological opinion for uh, from February 19th to March 1st, 2021. So I so move. Um, this is not a motion of the lobster board, so it would need a second. Um, Shri Patterson? Yes, I'm seconding the motion. Thank, Thank you. you. So motion by Mr. Borden, seconded by Ms. Patterson. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? Is uh, Karen, I'm assuming you're abstaining? Yes, that's correct, thank you. Great, um, is there any, uh, be, noting the uh, abstention from no fisheries, is there any objection to the motion? Seeing no objections, hearing no objections, the motion passes. Great, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes the letters from the Lobster Management Board and the new motion uh, by uh, Mr. Borden. We do have one more letter recommended by the, uh, that has been recommended by the Shadden River Hearing Board. Uh, Mike Armstrong, are you uh, online? I am. Great, would you like to read this motion uh, into the record? Sure. On behalf of the Shad and River Herring Board, move to send a letter to NOAA Fisheries to request that Shad be made a higher sampling priority, particularly for genetic stock composition sampling, to improve our understanding of the impacts of mixed stock fisheries on system-specific stocks, as recommended by the 2020 assessment and peer review and the technical committee. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, this is a motion brought forward by the Shadden River Herring Board. Uh, does not need a second. Uh, are there any questions uh, of Mike? Karen, assuming that's an abstention? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Mike, the same old, Mike, the same with Fish and Wildlife? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, noting the abstentions of both NOAA Fisheries and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, is there any um, other uh, objections to the letter or any objections to the letter? Seeing no objections, the letter passes. Thank you very much. So that concludes the votes on what ended up being five separate letters. 
Um, Shri, um, you had one item, uh, new item uh, for business. Could you, why don't you go ahead with that? Yes, thank you. Um, I'll start out with the question. When we are voting on species specific um, plans, and there are recommendations from the PRTs or the TCs, but yet we don't include those within the vote of accepting um, these plans. Is that correct that they follow through with the vote to accept uh, these motions, or do we need to be including the recommendations from the PRTs or the TCs? I'm going to use one of my lifelines and ask Bob or Tony. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> um, uh, Shri, I would say if, uh, if the board, uh, oftentimes recommendations come in the form of tasking a body to do something or um, doing research. Um, and so some of those, those would require a board, a board tasking. So it doesn't, it would not automatically happen by approving the FMP review. Sorry, I was gonna sneeze. Um, so if the, if the board does want a task to occur that is being recommended, then you would need to task that body to do so. The approval does not make it automatic. Does that answer? It it does. Thank you. I would just like to um, have a recommendation that when we are voting on, for example, compliance reports and such, that there be an additional slide that indicates what the TC or the PT PRTs are recommending, so that that can be inclusive into the motions to accept any compliant and it's just an example any compliance reports it would it would extend out beyond that to assure that when we're approving a motion for accepting um, these reports or um, whatever that that we can be inclusive of what PRTs and TCs are wanting us to include. Following up, if that's okay, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, please. So when the when the ISFMP staff member goes, they would ask the board that specific question, are you including any of the specific recommendations in this motion or do you want us to remind the board of that? Is that what you're asking for? Are you sort of saying to, in general, um, folks that are making that motion would need to also include the language of what recommendations they want to carry forward? Inclusive with the, a lot of times we just have a canned motion that indicates, will you approve? Um, for example, the compliance report. Yep. If there was a PRT or TC recommendations to that, it might be nice for the management boards to be able to see those recommendations so that they can include those in that canned motion. Three, if I if I might, um, I, I think I'm following where you're going, but I think there's a level of complication here and looking at the hour. I'm wondering if we might want to just bring this back up at the executive committee, since we'll be having several calls between now and the next meeting, just to make sure we fully understand, and then we can have, if needed, if need be, have additional policy board conversations around it. That's fine with me. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you, Shuri. I appreciate that. 
Um, is there any additional business to be brought before the policy board? Bob Beal. No, I was going to comment on the last thing, but all set. I knew my arm was tired. I guess I was holding my hand up too long. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, and uh, I, I really appreciate the conversations um, we've had this week. This has been a long week um, and, and ending here at 430 on a Thursday afternoon. The only benefit is we're not all running to uh, Washington Reagan to jump on a plane. So um, a lot of good conversations, a lot of difficult conversations this week. Um, uh, you know, state rights continue to prevail within the organization, which I'm always appreciative of. Um, but but obviously more work to do. And, and based on the uh, survey results, um, there's always always more work to do. So um, uh, at this time, um, knowing that we do not need a business session, um, I would be looking for a motion to adjourn. Steve Bowman. Steve has made a motion to adjourn, seconded by Doug Hamans. Um, any objections to the motion to adjourn? Seeing none, Mel Bell, your hand is up. Did you have something? Mel Bell's hand is now not up. So I don't think we have anything. So a motion to adjourn uh, passes without objection. I want to thank you all again for a very productive week. Um, have a great rest of the week and be safe. Thank you very much. This concludes our business for the winter meeting.